Today on Energy Contact, many people tend to think of alternative healers as witch doctors, uh, voodoo people. But it's interesting that we call alternative medicine alternative because it's really been around a lot longer. From time immemorial through the mid-1800s, it was the medical doctors who were considered on the fringe. Today, we're going to look at how controversial stances on the social issue of abortion turned all that around. Are you intrigued? It's coming up right now on Energy Contact. Hello and welcome to Energy Contact. My name is Joseph Willenbrink. Thank you for joining me and thank you to the production staff here in the studio for helping me get my message out to you. Energy Contact is a series that I'm presenting to you as a public service. It's about attaining health, growth, self-improvement, happiness, and realizing your full potential. It's designed to present you a new way of seeing yourself and a new way of seeing the world around you. We're talking about things that have to do with making an energetic contact energetic contact with yourself internally and with your environment. There's no difference between the body, the mind, the spirit, the emotion, the intellect, the ego. There's no difference between mass and energy. Goodness, we love to separate and dissect and categorize these things out and divide them. But in fact, all that health and growth and self-improvement comes about when we do just the opposite, when we combine them, put them together, and make energetic contact. Make an energetic contact between the unseen world and this physical one. We're presenting on this program a brand new paradigm, a brand new paradigm that is thousands of years old. We're presenting extraordinary topics for ordinary people. And let's move right ahead with that and let's bring up our first slide. Everyone please know that I am not a doctor. I don't want to be a doctor. This show is in no way a medical advice show. It's not about giving medical advice and I don't give medical advice anyway. I might call myself an energy healer or a chakra healer, so might a lot of other people. But it's important to know that state, federal, and local governments absolutely do not. They do no such thing. There's important information on this slide. We're going to leave it up for a couple of more seconds, and I hope you will read it with, uh, with consciousness and awareness. And when you've got it down, this would be a good time, if you would, to go locate a pencil and paper. Now here's why you want to do that. At the end of the show, we're going to roll some credits. And on those credits, there's going to be contact information for me. I invite and encourage you to contact me. I hope you will. But in order to do that, you're going to need the contact information. And in order to get that, you're going to need a pencil and paper. There will be plenty of time to jot that stuff down at the end of the show if you have a pencil and paper ready. So please go get that now. All right, let's come back up here. Today's show is show number 42. If you're joining me for the first time today, thank you. Thank you and welcome. These shows are sequential. They do build. And so there will be some things that you've missed out on, a little up to speed time, a little ramp up time that you will have missed. However, I'm doing my very best to make each show have great value on a standalone basis. And I think you'll get a lot out of this show. If it is your first time and if what you see piques your interest, then I'll invite you to look for previous shows, earlier shows. They'll be, they'll be airing later, either re-airing here on this channel or perhaps airing in the different cable areas where your friends live. If you'll look for them, I appreciate it. And now it's the time of our show where we're going to bring my co-host on. We're going to bring Slim on camera here. Where's Slayer's my buddy Slim? Slim is the brains of this outfit. Since we're investigating what it is that energy contacts in the physical self, we have to know a couple of things, don't we? We have to know something about energy. And this show is certainly about energy. But all that energy out there somewhere does us no good whatsoever. It does us no good until we understand what that thing is that the energy contacts. Slim is here to help us understand that. 
Remember, a body without energy is just a corpse. You can go to the funeral home and see them all day long. An energy without a body, it might be a number of wonderful things, but none of them are human. All right, let's move right ahead. Previously on Energy Contact, we have been looking at the body intellect, the body intellect and the anatomy that it builds. We've been looking at how the same things in our brains that give us thought, memory, reason, recall, intellect, all of those things that we've come to think of as brain things, how they are in fact in every cell of our body. We've seen how that body intellect builds us, how we are creations of that, how thought builds anatomy in very real ways. Over the past few shows, we've been looking at the history and philosophy of how we think about ourselves, is how we think about our health and how we take care of our health, or not. We've been comparing and contrasting two main schools of thought with respect to health care. Conventional medicine, otherwise known as Western medicine, allopathic medicine, standard medicine. This is the medicine that you go to the doctor for, the stuff that your health care plan covers. This is the medicine based on the work of Rene Descartes and Francis Bacon and the scientific method, the scientific revolution in the early 1600s. And on the other side of the fence, there's alternative medicine also known as holistic medicine, complementary medicine, natural medicine, naturopathic medicine. This is the herbs and the supplements, the things you get at the healthy food store, things that your doctor will not endorse and your health insurance will not pay for. We've seen that what we call alternative encompasses a number of different things. In fact, it's a little bit unfair to put them all under the same umbrella, but they do have somewhat of a, of a similar philosophical underpinning. So with the time we've got, that's what we'll have to do. And we've seen that while both the conventional and alternative systems are great, that, that they are fundamentally, foundationally different at the core. We've looked a lot about the reasons about that. And all along, we've been speaking about this mystical, magical energy that the old mystics and old yogis called kundalini energy. Okay, so today we're continuing to look at that. We're continuing to look at the divergent foundations upon which our healthcare systems are based. And that effect that they have and the effect that all of this stuff has on the way we think about our health. Particularly today, we want to look at how these two systems have coexisted or more accurately failed to coexist in the United States. We looked previously at the story of Descartes and the beginnings of how reductionist, dualist science separated, departed from that holistic, monistic model that has existed about health from time immemorial. But all that happened in the 1600s in Europe, where alternative modalities have always enjoyed, and to this day still do enjoy, more mainstream support than they do here in the United States. Today, we're going to look at some of the distinctly American experiences with respect to healthcare that make it different here. And we'll see some things that are going to surprise you. And we want to further this study, to further understand both the differences in perspective and the great value that both of these systems can have for us if we can just see past those differences and integrate that information. All right, so lofty goals for today but now, everybody sit back for a second and take a big deep breath. Because <sighs> now is the time in our show where we get to visualize. We're going on our virtual field trip. And today, we're going back to my virtual house. It's been a little while since we visited my virtual house. So welcome back. And today, we're going to a room in this house that's a meeting room. And in this room, everybody and there's a lot of everybody's, they're in there discussing politics. Specifically, they're Americans discussing U.S. politics. And there's an array, there's Democrats over there and Republicans over there, liberals, conservatives, lefties, righties, a Green Party person, a libertarian or two, they're all over and everyone has very different ideas and the conversation, the debate, the argument in fact, gets pretty heated sometimes. Someone, after a while, in an exasperated voice, gets up and says, you know, we're never going to reconcile our differences. We're all just too far apart. But at this moment, 
One guy who's been sitting quiet in the back of the room stands up, and we observe that this is the one guy in the room who's not an American. And he begins to speak, and with a very thick accent, by the way. And he says, what do you mean you guys are different? You're all exactly the same. You're all proponents of the same system. You're just bickering over meaningless details. Your goals are exactly the same. Why are you fighting? You should be working together. Hmm. It is all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Hold that thought for a second. We have been looking at the models, the models upon which our healthcare systems are based. Every math and science student learns this following statement. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. The models that we build to understand things are not supposed to be either accurate or precise. The fact that our medical model is all wrong neither surprises us nor concerns us. The alternative models are wrong too, all of them. Some of the greatest scientific discoveries in history, things that we still use in our practical daily life, have been developed using just absolutely wrong models. So, the object of the game is not to win the debate on which model is better. The object is health, growth, self-improvement, happiness, realizing our full potential, and having that for everybody, having it for all of us. Like political parties, we have these fundamentally different views about how to get healthy and stay that way. But while the perspectives may indeed be incompatible, the goal is the same. It should not be an either-or situation. And we want to understand how it got to that, how it got to an either-or situation. Because we'd all do a lot better if we would stop focusing on our differences and begin focusing on the common goal. All right, once upon a time, there was no difference. There was no difference at all. There was just health care. There wasn't this kind of health care or that kind. And over the past few shows, we've been looking at the whens and the wheres and the wherefores of how paths digressed, how, how we came to a parting of our ways, and how these things became different, how they became, in fact, competitive and adversarial to the detriment and the harm of all of us. In Europe, standard and alternative systems, they coexist reasonably peaceful, at least relative to the way they are here. So there is something different in that American experience. There's something different from things that happened here that are specific to here. That's what we're looking at today. But first, we want to set the stage just a little bit more. Back in the 19th century, in the 1800s, Western medicine was one of a few different methods of health care. And it was neither the most accepted nor the most safe. Back in that day, medical science didn't understand things like germs and septics and antiseptics and sepsis infections. None of that stuff. Not nearly as well as we do today. Therefore, at that time, little minor procedures, they could, they could result in infections, in gangrenes, amputations, and in death a lot of time for simple things. Well, at this time in England, there was a fellow named Joseph Lister. And Joseph Lister was pioneering a new concept that he was calling sterile surgery. It was in the 1850s, and he suggested that doctors' hands and doctors' instruments ought to be washed before digging them into people's guts. What a revolutionary idea. His research, by the way, had its roots in a mistaken model, a mistaken belief in a non-existent toxic, toxic vapor called miasma. He didn't even know what caused the problem he was fixing, but he still fixed it. He was using a faulty model. But let's not digress. For a while, it's interesting to know that he was scoffed at and laughed at by his peers for having the temerity to suggest that doctors should wash their hands before surgery. Doctors knew when the time was to wash your hands. You're supposed to wash your hands after surgery. So, at this time, Western medicine was very primitive. It was very witch doctory. And it wasn't just surgery either. Doctors were still treating diseases with substances like mercury and arsenic, things that are much more deadly than were the diseases that they were treating with them. Again, just very witch doctory in their approach. Herbal and natural treatments back then, just like today, were much more in harmony with the natural functioning of the human body. 
And everyone at that time, unlike today, just seemed to be very intuitively aware of that. And so that methodology, that natural methodology at that time was helping many more people and harming far less people than what we know today as conventional method medicine. So herbalists, naturopaths, midwives, doulas, homeopaths, they were the way to go for health maintenance, for wellness care. What the doctor was there for, if at all, was for sickness care. You didn't need to go to him until unless you got sick. And there were certain things, like for example, pregnancy and maternity, they were hardly ever taken to a doctor. Think about it. Why would a healthy woman carrying a healthy baby want to go to a place where they take sick people? That wouldn't make much sense, would it? As a matter of fact, when the time for delivery got near, what she looked for was the care of a uh, experienced woman, a woman who who had a little kindness and nurturing ability and a few kids of her own who'd been that before. She was not interested in some dude in a white coat. And by the way, at that time, all the doctors were dudes. Um, so she wasn't interested in that dude in the white coat that, uh, that was bringing a bunch of sick people cooties with him. Wouldn't make any sense at all. So doctors, realizing this, just like people in any industry, decided they needed to do something, something to give them a little credibility, to change their image a little bit. And they decided, here in the United States, to form a trade association. Hold that thought for a second. We're going to look at trade associations. So the purpose of competition is to beat your opponent. Simple enough. In a capitalist, free market economy, trade associations are a good thing to help you achieve that goal. Let's take a completely unrelated one. For example, the California Avocado Board. The California Autocavo avocado industry knows that there is only room on your plate or in your stomach for so much. And so they have a mission, a goal. They want to convince you that having an avocado on your plate is a better idea than, say, having a, a fig, a turnip, an artichoke, whatever. Now, if the artichoke growers have a problem with that, well, they're just going to need to form a trade association of their own and promote themselves. There are similar stories for every industry. For example, there's a steel trade association in the United States that wants to convince companies that use steel to buy U.S. steel. Even though foreign steel might be a little cheaper, they're trying to give them reasons to stay domestic. Or for that matter, to use U.S. steel rather than U.S. copper or U.S. tin. You get the idea. What does this have to do with doctors? Well, in competitive strategy, we're talking now more marketing than we are medicine by far. In competitive strategy, if you get tagged with something negative, like being a witch doctor, then one strategy is to get the competition to be labeled as, the, as more negative than you are, as more of a witch doctor than you are. This is a very common strategy still today. You see it in political parties every time election season rolls around. It takes one to know one. All right, let's bring some of this stuff together. In 1847, in the United States of America, before Joseph Lister's breakthrough with uh, sepsis and antiseptics, a national convention of medical doctors was convened. And the American Medical Association was born, the AMA. And their purpose was, of course, like any trade association, to get people to leave whatever they're doing and come over to them, to come over to their industry, standard medicine. Now, there are multiple aspects of the AMA, just as with any trade association. For the AMA, there's a medical one, there's a marketing one, there's a political lobbying one, and so on and so forth. But this new AMA was just starting out. They didn't really know what to do. They were doctors. They weren't business experts. But they did know that they needed to find an issue. They needed a big issue, a splash. They needed a hot-button topic where they were being outclassed by the natural healers and where they could hop in and pick a fight and win it. The most salient area at that time that they could identify was maternity and obstetrics. Remember, at that time, a healthy expectant mother had no business being around doctors. So, when they searched for an issue relative to this, you'll never believe what they found the AMA decided to get abortions banned, 
outlawed. Yep, the reason that abortions were illegal in the United States for 100 years is because the AMA worked very long and very hard to make them so. Now hold that thought for a second. Brings us to another uh, side story. The topic of abortion, we have to address it for just a second. It is not the purpose of energy contact to participate in social debate. And this is a very emotional subject to a lot of people. I'm doing my very best here just to give you historical facts, void of opinion, void of emotion, regarding the history of the AMA and the abortion. But the facts are there. They're recorded history. I hope that regardless of your position, you'll get something out of the story. If you're very emotional about the subject, please try to just to keep that set aside just for a moment, and let's just look at the history. And you will realize that, depending on your perspective, the AMA is either the one to blame or the one to thank for the abortion controversy that we have today. All right, from time immemorial, through the mid-1800s, abortions were reasonably commonplace in the United States. They were not controversial at all. There was a word they used at that time. The word was quickening. This word quickening describes when the baby begins to move. It, it's at a time about the fourth or the fifth month into pregnancy, the point at which that child becomes a viable human life. Abortions were always considered moral and ethical by clergy, churches, social conservatives, everyone, until this time of quickening. Abortions were common enough at the time our nation was born that the framers of the Constitution knew all about them and didn't figure it was enough of an issue to include in the Constitution one way or another. So, let's bring that back to the fledgling AMA. Why did doctors want to get involved with this? Because remember, doctors were not big in the maternity business at all. In these days, it was their best interest as a marketing organization to take a benign issue and make it controversial. And the best way they could figure out how to defeat their competition, naturopaths, homeopaths, midwives, was to get these practices made illegal. So they launched a very successful uh, crusade. It was entitled The Physician's Crusade Against Abortion. A lot of publicity, a lot of hoopla. It was launched in 1855 by a very famous inaugural speech, a lecture delivered by a Dr. David Storer. And this David Storer's son, another doctor, Horatio Storer, took up the banner and led the AMA to getting abortions banned, illegalized, outlawed in every state in the Union, one by one, from about 1859 through 1910. It took them 50 years, but they stuck with it, and they got their job done. And they did this by framing it as a moral and ethical issue. Crushing the competition is what made them want to outlaw abortion. And they succeeded at both, both getting abortions outlawed and in vilifying its practitioners. And not vilifying its practitioners solely for this practice, but for all practices. Whew, so remember, we got multiple AMAs here, huh? We got the medical arm, the marketing arm, the political action committee arm, and so on. The job of all these, the job altogether, is the AMA wants to push its own agenda and, ag and agree or disagree with them and their agenda, either then or now, the AMA did one of the best jobs of anyone, anytime, any place, anywhere in history of moving their agenda. They did a masterful job. They marketed their product, they got laws passed, everything. They were Machiavellian and they were darn good at it. They got themselves legislated in the United States as the sole thing, the way, the option that the public had at its disposal with respect to health care. And in so doing, they set up a health care monopoly that exists to this very day. And at the same time, do you know what those op alternative practitioners were doing? <laughs> they were doing nothing. They were doing a horrible job at self-promotion. They did not form a trade organization. They did not promote themselves. They did not defend themselves. And for a hundred years or so, the AMA succeeded in getting their competition perceived by folks, folks like you and me, as the witch doctors, the voodoo people. And that went on 
until about the early 1970s. So what happened in the early 1970s to turn that around? Why are we seeing a steadily growing revolution today? Well, it was the convergence of many things. It was the aftermath of the so-called human potential movement, the aftermath of Carl Jung and, and Wilhelm Reich, and, the, and that, that all that continued through the beatnik generation and the, and the hippie cultures and the so-called uh, sexual revolution of the 60s. It was the transition by the medical industry at that same time from healthcare provider to economic giant. And people began to regard that as mechanistic, as dehumanizing. It was the disappearance of that friendly Norman Rockwell-like family doctor that you see in all those 30s movies who came to your house and sat by the side of the kids' beds and dispensed advice. It was the growth of big pharmaceutical companies into something that the public began to perceive as more drug pushers than health care providers. And it was the revolutionary discovery of these things we've talked about over the past few shows, these neuropeptides, receptors, these interactions that finally provided science with that missing link between physical molecules and our emotional and our spiritual selves. And perhaps above all, it was just the fact that repression breeds rebellion. The medical industry had become something that was very repressive. And these were rebellion times, rebellious times. You could argue that this all sort of began with Albert Einstein. And if you did, you could farther, further argue that even Albert Einstein had his roots centuries and centuries ago and that it all began with those old yogis and mystics meditating in the woods. But I mentioned Einstein, and that takes us real quickly to where we were in U.S. history. Remember, when Einstein came along in the early 1900s, it was only one generation after the rise of the AMA. So you would think that practitioners of alternative modalities, they would have kind of got their stuff together. They would have bounced back. But guess again, because at the same time Einstein was making his discoveries, mainstream doctors, Salk and Pasteur and Pauling, were doing great things using the medical model. And that caught people's attention. So medicine was making great strides. And they were using a wrong model, just like Lister was using a wrong model, just like everybody else has. But they were doing great things. So let's bring that back to the political debate. All of the people on every side of the discussion are looking at who's got the better debate. But the answer is improvement for everybody. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining me. I wish you peace and positive energy and a healthy life in energy contact. <laughs>